Today we're going to be speaking about the future of training. Um, with me today, uh, I have two guests. I am Jake Soderberg. I am the Chief Sales Officer here at uh, Synergy XR, and I am, as probably a lot already know, obsessed with the business value that new technologies provide to businesses. I'm going to let uh, our guests really uh, dig deep on, on today's topics. With me today to cover the topic of the future of training, I have uh, Pernille. Uh, online and a virtual, uh, it's not an avatar, but it's uh, almost as good. Pernille, yeah. uh, please introduce yourself and, and your role at Copenhagen uh, University. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me on this podcast. I'm very excited about that. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Pernille Bjørn and I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen at the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and there I ha I'm have a specialty, my research specialty is in what is called Computer Supported Cooperative Work, or CSCW. So this is how do we actually design cooperative technologies with the aim of supporting people collaborating. And uh, I have uh, an interest, uh, and I think this is also why I'm invited here, is to actually explore more in terms of cooperative virtual reality or extended reality. So uh, I'm very happy to be here and and kind of get to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, we'll, we're looking forward to hearing your insights on, on this topic uh, for sure. Also with me today, Pia. A uh, good friend of the house. Welcome. Good Thanks. to have you here. Thanks. Nice to be back. Please introduce yourself and the company you uh, represent today. Yeah. Yep. yep. I'm uh, Per. I'm a head of innovation at a company called Mask Training, which is part of the Mask family. Um, we are a company that have been uh, in the safety training business for more than 40 years. Actually starting with an accident, a mm. very severe accident that yeah. we had on a rig in the North Sea. And then uh, evolved into being our internal uh, powerhouse of uh, knowledge around how do you do safe operations in high-risk environments. Yeah. And then at some point, uh, we started you know, opening up our business to, to others and external. And today is a global company that are present uh, on all uh, continents and working in operational high-risk industries within maritime, within the energy and within uh, offshore renewables. And uh, to say a bit about myself, yes, then uh, I've spent a good 20 years in uh, Maersk, uh, first half of them uh, offshore, so hands-on in the operational environment, and the last 10 of them working with training and learning. And that have uh, naturally led me into, of course, uh, being explorative around how, how can we make better learning that are more accessible and more powerful for my former colleagues, uh, whether that being at sea or whether that being offshore. And uh, one of the things that we really, you know, uh, put our eyes on, that's uh, XR, VR, and extended reality technologies, yeah. which uh, is also uh, where I met uh, Pernille and mm -hmm. uh, had the pleasure of uh, collaborating on a couple of uh, projects and hosting some of uh, Pernille's uh, fantastic uh, students that have brought us uh, new knowledge, but also helped us uh, understanding much more what can this do for people. Yeah. Offshore and at sea. Okay, perhaps you can elaborate just a little bit on on what what does that cooperation look like and and what what have how have you worked together? I still remember uh, that it was quite many years ago. I actually can't remember which year it was, Pierre, uh, that I was first visiting a mass training in Svendborg, and I was extremely like uh, so. I have my, I'm a professor in computer science. Of course, I'm very interested in technologies, and I was very very impressed with the full uh, mission. Um, uh, training uh, uh, simulators that was in Svendborg. And just the whole idea of how do we like, kind of use all that expertise in how do we actually do these training uh, for cooperative engagement. What was really exciting for me was that we were talking about how several people could collaborate on a bridge, on a leading a ship and finding out how to do coordination or awareness across these different things and actually do that in a full simulators that is digitalized, which was really exciting for me. And then what was have been like my, my research interest has then been to say, how do if we were to kind of move from these full scale simulators into virtual reality, where there's still several people collaborating with each other to see what they can do, that's like the next step for me. So yeah, I guess it's, I, I, I think it's quite many years ago actually, here. I can't remember when it was. Four or five years, probably. Uh, I think time I is think flying so. when you're having fun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, and then um, 
you know, uh, me and Pierre talked several times uh, and uh, I had some students who then came and, and, and visited uh, Mask over several times and we did like prototypes and tested them out with real life trainers. So, um, yeah, that's actually been really, um, I mean, I really enjoyed, I still enjoy our collaboration very much. Yeah, and I can say the exact same thing, Panila. And I think one of the things that that both yourself and your student have brought to us is, of course, a more scientific-based uh, approach also to how do we take the things that we see uh, working well with the big uh, immersive full mission simulators uh, that that are fantastic uh, learning environment. But how how do we uh, take these things and bring them into the new uh, opportunities that the evolution of uh, VR, XR technologies have opened up for us? Because there's no doubt that if you look at the learning impact, it's a fantastic environment having full mission set up, having a, we have a team of in-house psychologists. We have a lot of very, very experienced people that, that, that have spent a lot of time offshore in the operational environment, right? So it is a fantastic learning setup. But it's also very expensive, and it's something that is limited to uh, basically meaning that the mainly the senior officers and the officers get the training, yeah. and they only get it maybe mm-hmm. once every five years or every ten years. Yeah. So how do we take all the things that that we see that works well and that people really really praising, saying this is fantastic, best course I've been on, and so on? Yeah. But how do we make that much more accessible to people all around the globe so that they can? I know we'll speak much more about that, but yeah. but really train you know on demand, when they need it, much more accessible, et cetera, by utilizing technology. Absolutely. So and when we do and, that, uh, mm-hmm. uh, how do we anchor that in yes. what Panille and, and her team have proven and, and that, that works, yeah. right? So, so it's scientific-based. That's important for us. Yeah. Right. I love yeah, that. I, it, I, I, yeah. No, go ahead, Panille. Yeah. So I think also uh, that what is really so fascinating with this specific area is actually that there are so many artifacts and that, you know, it, it really matters how the rope are like um, on the boat and in terms of safety and that, that so, and I think that's a really interesting challenge for computer scientists as me. So one thing is that I think that the whole setup is interesting and so on, but it actually also provide me uh, an, uh, an opportunity to study research questions I otherwise are not able to study. Mm. Because actually you would say within my field of CSW, it's impossible to test anything in an um, in a testing environment or because collaboration, other things always happen. So yeah. if you like make a completely test out where you kind of take everything out, you can't really see what's going on. But what is really interesting with these full mission uh, simulators uh, is that it's actually an open-ended collaboration. Everything can happen. So the challenge is how do we then take that from the full mission and make it into a digital environment. And as Pierre said, kind of be, make it able to, so more people can take it and so on. I think that transformation is actually uh, making it possible to study research questions we otherwise would not at all be able to study. Yeah. And we will dive a little further into that uh, at some later points. So thank you very much for, for giving that introduction. And, and I love the work that you've been doing together. Uh, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's inspiring. So, so we will cover. Uh, I, I mean, like four major topics today. I'll just quickly walk through them, and then uh, let's dive into the different uh, uh, topics. But, but the evolution of training. I mean, we we already kind of covered a little bit about that, but we will dive into kind of how training has evolved, and and perhaps for 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 this uh, setting, let's just give our definition when we talk about training today i mean at least from my point i'm i'm thinking specifically about the the skills training how to learn either a new skill or being upskilled and 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 repetitive training and so forth uh, today we're not necessarily talking about how to handle a certain like uh, a delicate conversation that that's not the type of training it's more hands-on and i'm sure we will cover uh, a little more in depth why muscle memory is a thing i usually mention that every time i talk about training i'm sure panilla has a much more scientific approach to that so looking forward to to elaborate on that uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the safety in training uh, and why immersive training is 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 very well suited for for that specific topic. The accessibility and the the global reach. We already talked a little bit about that. We're, we're going to dive further into that. And ultimately, let's uh, let's talk about uh, accelerated learning. And again, 
there are so many terms and and definitions of what extended reality is or spatial computing or the metaverse or virtual reality so so i'm sure let's just throw everything in the bucket as long as we add a few more words to when i say this i mean this uh, this is the terms that i work with uh, because we're, we're still not uh, settled science when, when it comes to, to at least agreeing on, on the different uh, definitions. So, so let's, uh, the evolution of training, let's, let's, let's start there and perhaps appear with, with a very hands-on uh, approach. How, how do you see that, that training has evolved over the last years with, with MERS training, for example? Well, um, I, th- I think training have involved, it, you can say, in, in, in many ways. Uh, one of the things that we definitely see is that there is a strong need for maybe a bit shorter courses, but mm. also a bit more on-demand training. So uh, if I look at today's workforce, uh, there's much more multi-skilled mm. workers, meaning that they, they, sh- they should be able to do a lot of different things. But it also means that if you chunk it again in bytes of, let's say, uh, five days that you get every five years, well... Uh, we know that not all of it right will will get to the work side. The where stickiness if, is exactly the yeah. learning retention will, will be low, and maybe also uh, the classroom to workplace transfer will, will uh, yeah. to, to some extent also be lower yeah. than if we could uh, evolve and mm-hmm. uh, innovate on training so that we to a higher extent is able to deliver training uh, on demand when it's needed. Yeah. Then we also see, of course, there is a strong uh, desire for digital learning solutions. Uh, COVID, uh, we mm. can say a lot of bad things about it, but yep. one of the good things you can say is definitely that that it uh, moved boundaries, I think, yeah. on, on what we believe can be done uh, and what we know can be done digital. Yeah. And uh, we see that now, I can call it the, the second wave of the evolution that started during COVID coming, yeah. where, where we want to bring digital products and we see a need for digital products that is not necessarily something we've put together over the weekend because we had to, <laughs> but that is really well thought to, well designed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that will open up for learning going from uh, one size fits all, mm-hmm. instructor paced to much more individualized, much more learner paced uh, yeah. and also mixed into a blended learning journeys where we work on, on different yeah. formats. Yeah. 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 And if I should put a few words on also, how do I see that uh, VR, XR technology yes, is, is supporting that? Then I, w- I would say in the industries we're working in, e-learning, video-based learning, et cetera, that, that's been there for 20, 30 years, starting yep. uh, all the way from the VHS uh, tape and, oh, and yeah. the multiple choice checklist yeah. to, to uh, engaging and gamify the e-le- e-learnings. It's been there for a while. Yeah. But the challenge have always been to... Uh, to go from a knowledge taxonomy to skill-based taxonomies. Yeah. Um, and that's where we see that VR, XR is a game changer because mm. it allows us to train hands-on yeah. in a digital environment, much more accessible, much more individualized. So that, that's where we really see that this is an important evolution in training. Yeah. Penela, I'm mm. sure you yes. have a, a f- Yes. A little add-on to that. Yeah, yeah, I would love to add on here. So I think that uh, when I think about what we, uh, in my uh, research, when we study cooperative practices, what is important is that there is a lot of professional knowledge and expertise that people have when they deal with it. This could be like uh, sailors or like uh, all kind of different activities. And I think when you think about that knowledge production, that expertise that people have, it is very much related to the kind of language they use, what activities they do, how they handle artifact and so on. And I think what is, if I should think about kind of the evolution or the change where I think um, uh, extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these different technologies can put in is that where we prior could very much focus on doing what I will call scripted practices, right? Mm -hmm. Routine. So this is where you, it's very clear what the input is, what the output is, how are you supposed to do things? Which is great, but I think compared to why I think the really interesting thing is, it is how do we try to train situated practices in open and a cooperative uh, situation where the complex uh, activities of work is actually involving and they are part of what people need to be able to handle. Because if you are thinking about any kind of real life dangerous situation, it often does not, it doesn't happen that often. 
But if you want to train it, you really need to uh, know what to do in those situations. And that will never help you if you just have a scripted practice that you know this is the routine you have to do. So what I think is really exciting for using extended reality for, for training is actually that we can move away from just thinking about, you know, uh, scripted practices, routine, to actually having these large, and when I say large, it's not necessarily big. It's just like uh, highly complex uh, work practices that we can actually uh, test out and help people to train things like situational awareness, uh, how to actually uh, deal with coordinative artifacts, which is critical when you are in a dangerous situation, which I learned a lot from, from Pierre when he mm -hmm. taught me a lot about maritime. <laughs> but actually, it's also some of the things that when we design whatever kind of cooperative setting and technologies for doing that, uh, not just for VR, but in other situations, we would normally try to reduce the effort of, of the complexity because we will make technology to help people to do it better. But when we do it in terms of training, we actually want to consist you to perceive or, or can ha still have all that complexity to allow people to train that complexity and not take it away. And I think that extended uh, virtual reality is actually a way to do that, which I have not seen in, in otherwise, um, uh, I mean, where you can really deal with the artifacts and the objects and the activities that people do and also monitor what other piece people do at the same time and then act accordingly. So this is kind of where I see the, the kind of the evolution from more focusing on um, routine uh, scripted practices to actually these open-ended complex cooperative situations. Yeah. But but I very much, uh, I, I think it's an important point, uh, Pernille, exactly that, that if we also look at the, again, the, the evolution in the industries we're working in, then if we look at the safety performance, there's no doubt about that that have improved a lot o over the years, but it's also clear that, that in some industries they, they got to a very low stage, but it's not got to zero, right? And one of the things that's become more and more recognized in industries is actually that the things where we could remove complexity, we've done that, right? Mm. So the remaining complexity, we need to make sure that the people that we're sending out in the front line, they are well prepared to handle that dynamic uh, risk picture yeah. and uh, one of the challenges with with such situations is that because it is a high risk environment because it is a dynamic picture it's very very hard to train in real life so yeah. you need a safe environment to train that in yeah. and that's where i, I agree with you panilla that, that and that's also what we've seen in some of the mm. i remember the master uh, study yeah. that, that a couple of, of your students did that that uh, having this free play opportunity where people can test out different coping strategies they can fail in a safe environment and they can learn from it. Yeah. That is uh, fantastic, uh, both in terms of, of building skills, yeah. uh, building that capability to, to fail in, yeah. in a safe way, uh, but actually also to boost the motiva motivation for, for working safe. Yeah. So uh, I agree this, this is another great area where, where you can say technology is, is enabling uh, yeah. us to become safer here. Yeah, yeah. that's very okay. interesting to hear. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and, and, and speaking of, of, of safety, let's just, uh, let's just move along to, to, to that next uh, topic cluster of, of ours. I mean, and, and yeah, uh, one thing is performing a, a, a highly complex task somewhere, but, but add height, add strong winds, add uh, high altitudes and, and, and stormy weather. And I've, I have yet to visit one of your offshore. Uh, when, when do I get that invitation, we, by the way? We, we, need, Le yeah. we need to do that next because, time and train more, uh, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but so, so you can train all you want, but when you add those factors and, and you can mimic some of them in, in VR, you, you have a completely different learning situation. Um, so, so that's, of course, uh, something. But, but Panilla, again, from, from your point of view, that the safety aspect uh, when it comes to training, how, how, how do you see that play along with, with the enabling of, of these technologies and, and using these technologies? So I think that uh, to really, this is as also something I actually learned from Pierre, yeah. <laughs> so through all our collaboration, is that uh, I found it so interesting that in the very early meetings, which I guess then is like four years ago, or whenever it was, uh, was that there is a core concept within CSW, my research field, which is called uh, situational awareness and there is like a counterpart the same thing Pierre is also using the concept of situational awareness and I think those two concepts are like so aligned in what are we trying to design for 
And for me, what is what is coming from that is this context. You need to understand that activities or failures or risk situation are never outside of a context. So I think what is really important if you think about safety or immersive training is that what extended reality really can do is they can provide that context. That context, which include not just, uh, you know, the physical surroundings, you can of course see those in the artifact, but it's also that you can kind of play with the idea is how do you notice or not notice a potential risk or something that might develop into a risk before it's even a risk? Yeah. And that's actually what you really want to try to train. So I remember in that um, uh, 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 that prototype we did a couple of years ago uh, with Maya and Andrea was that it was um, uh, it was about dis- detecting where there might be risk in terms of how the rope was located on the uh, on the actual ship and how you're not supposed to walk across these ropes. And it's not because you couldn't do that in this. You could totally do that as much as you wanted, but it would help, uh, it would kind of, um, uh, you will be able to reflect upon it afterwards. So what we did back then with with that particular prototype was that we actually tested out uh, the mooring scenario in the prototype, and then afterward had the recordings of that mooring scenario discussing with the people who were in the actual uh, environment and with a trainer and then see how that situation of reflective conversation with the trainer and then you could point to say well see here in that video like there we had like uh, all the point of view and then also like a bird view you could see well right here what happens there and then people started to reflect and say oh i didn't think about that or when i was there so this kind of putting in the context into that immersive uh, training i think is really interesting. And I think that's kind of a, something that is not possible in any other way, unless you build like a huge lot, big mock-up for people to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's really key. And and if I should add to that, Penilla, I think, uh, again, a, lo- a lot of the environments we work in, you cannot, uh, you cannot standardize the environment necessarily like you can do in a factory environment, right? It, weather, wind, and so on, it's hard to control. So you yeah. need to t- teach people how to navigate that. Yeah. One of the chances is that that a lot of that knowledge is actually tacit knowledge that they have built uh, o- over a year, and that also means that that the way we we learn that side by side takes yeah. a long time. You're depending on on who are you uh, following, uh, how good are they at a debriefing with you, and so on. So by taking that into a, a control environment where people can still have this free play, they can still experiment, they can fail, they can learn from that, they can have good facilitated debrief conversations where we talk about, okay, what, what were the risk I was focusing on here or uh, what do we need to, to pay attention to here and so on. So we create that alignment, we create that conversation around safety that they will not have had if they have not been together performing this task right. Yeah. And, and doing it in, a, again, an environment where there is time to, to reflect and to follow up on it so it, it creates learning. Because out there, a lot of it, it is about getting the job done, right? So if you do a mooring at uh, two o'clock at uh, night time, and the only thing you you think of is finishing, of course, in a safe way, yeah. but so you can get uh, yeah. back to bed because you probably have to get up six and and start your watch, right? So uh, often there's not a lot of learning ha- yeah. happening there, yeah. and and that's where again being able to recreate an environment like that, that uh, again, it's not something that a lot of yeah. simulations exist for. Right. Uh, so, because this is more accessible as a technology, and, and to to many extent a bit cheaper also than working with the very big uh, full mission settings that we have yeah. for, for critical phases where you can say the rig or the vessel is a, is at stake, then then it it opens up for safety training of of a different quality than yeah. than what we have historically had access to. Yeah. So. And I mean, what one super low practical way of, of thinking of, of extended reality as a business value driver with, within uh, your industry <laughs> is, is like you, you can, you cannot move away entirely the, the physical side by side learning, but you can move some of it onshore, which is at least to my understanding now much more cheap than, than actually putting people on choppers and flying them offshore and, and training them there. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say you you can move the training out to the people, 
So yes. uh, instead of moving the mooring training uh, onshore, which which you of course can do, yeah. uh, but then you can also uh, enable higher quality of training to happen in the work site. Yes. Right? So uh, again, many of the industries you work in, yeah. The, there are external factors you sometimes yeah. depending on. That could be the weather, that, that could be many other things, meaning that sometimes there are a bit of waiting time yeah. that actually could be turned into training yeah. time. Instead of idle time, you actually use it for something useful. Yeah. yeah. Of, of course, we have to be a bit careful that, uh, again, two o'clock at night time, you're not necessarily super receptive for, for, for learning. So we need to, to think of it and understand yeah. the environments we're working in. But that's where, again, our plus 40 years from, from working in these uh, industries and deep yeah. understanding of the environments uh, mean, mean that I think we are in a good position to, to be uh, some of yeah. those that really enables the, the technology to go there and, and our colleagues at sea to benefit from it. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's a great segue into the whole accessibility uh, topic that, that we also want to cover uh, just a little bit. I like the phrase that instead of actually bringing people into to, to the education, we're bringing the education or the learning to the to the people. Yeah, and it, t- uh, it ties a little bit back to, to the talk around the evolution of training. Yes. Right? A- again, so if we don't want to do it in uh, bite sizes of three, four, five days, but we do it in bite sizes of uh, 12 to 20 minutes or, or, yeah. or where we need to land this, right? Uh, design it for individual training for for hardcore, uh, you can say individual technical skills, and then use the same environment for training this high quality collaborative uh, learnings, uh, then I think we really, really have a recipe that can help the industries moving forward on safety performance. Yeah. Penelope, is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah, so, so I'm actually, I remember, now I'm saying it wrong, maybe Pierre, but you will correct me. I think you talked about how there's this uh, safety 2.0 uh, that moving from not just having certifications, but actually having people noticing, am I saying it right? I think that, you know, so it's not just about giving people certification that they're good and can do this thing. It's actually by having it as embodied knowledge, as tacit knowledge, like Pierre said before. And I think actually what is interesting in this kind is that you can Actually, if you kind of in the future, now we're also thinking like in the future, if we have enough very, very good training environment that really can help train these open-ended collaborative situations and they can be on the ships in different ways, it would actually, um, you know, allow people to not just continue to have the certification, which they actually have to have, but also to actually have this more complex training that hopefully can allow them to embed it the right position. I think another thing you told me once, Pierre, was I think you, you you compared it to when you drive in a car. You know, remember to watch up in the, the backside mirror, right? So it's about you have to get it into your body. You always do it because that's safe. And it's only very often, not very often, you really need to look there, but it should just be there. And I think this kind of embodied training is 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 something that we really want to put in out to many people because I think, uh, it's not just uh, so I, I was reading some of the literature from the maritime research, which is actually different what I normally normally I read like computer science literature, but I actually start to read also something into maritime research. And I think what was interesting in some of this way is that um, that what really leads to risk is not people people if you look at the risk situations, it's not because of, they don't have the certification. It is because they don't notice or they are tired and or it's a difficult situation. And, and then if they for like 100 times have done uh, whatever is needed to be done, but then that one time you need to follow the right order and you should look in the backside mirror or whatever it's needed. Mm-hmm. That's where you, so it should just be kind of embodied in how, how you interact. And I think that's, uh, if, if you want to put, then I also try to look in some of the other maritime research and training. It says that uh, when you, that, because of the change from having training centers around the world and how more and more people are actually not on the boat. So it's more, well, not there is people on the boat, but my point is that there is less people on the boat to actually do it because there's a lot of things that is becoming easier. That means having this side person training is not possible because people, it's, it's, you need to be very, very fast right away. So finding ways on the one hand to put it out, this embodied training and test knowledge on the boats, as they are, you know, on the boat, but at the same time, uh, making making sure that it's like in that context. I think, I think that's actually really interesting. Uh, so that's been some of the extra readings I have done. Is actually that's what the the research says. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think yeah, safety 2.0 is, is a, it's a huge topic, right? Where, where there's re- really a, a lot of good things to dive in, into. One of the things I I really like about it is how that that we really change from seeing humans as, as a as a risk uh, to humans uh, as as being a part of the solution. So again, instead of uh, now maybe I'm stereotyping a bit, but but uh, pointing fingers at our seafarers and seeing them as something that we need to fix, whether that's with writing procedures or giving them more. Uh, e-learnings, uh, etc. right? Then, then we start seeing them as the solution and saying, okay, what are the skills we need to equip them with to be successful in this situation here? Yeah. And uh, one of the things we can see is the dynamic risk assessment uh, that, that we've been training in this yeah. collaborative environment at, again, right? And, and, and as a thing that that is super important, dynamic but also... Dynamic risk assessment. Yeah, that, that, that means if, if I should... Uh, how do I explain that shortly? <laughs> well, well, you can take the driving example again. Yeah, right? There are yeah. a couple of things where, where you can see, okay, here's a risk that is uh, always present. Yeah, um, yeah. And then there are some risks that are evolving and changing. Sometimes they're more or less present all Got the it. time. Yeah. So if I ask you to drive here from Aarhus to Copenhagen, uh, there are rules that you need to know. There are some knowledge that you need to have. Yeah. But when you go on the road, there is, uh, you know, you keep an eye, okay, this car, does it look yeah. like he's going to pull out? This car, does it look okay. like he's going to drive close to you and so on? Yes. Maybe it starts it. raining. So the risk picture is varying yeah. all the time. Yeah. And that is, it's and very, very hard dynamic. to learn from a, from yeah. a textbook. You yes. need to learn it hands-on. Yeah. So that's where, again, the hands-on technology enabled comes. Yeah. But learning it hands-on in a high-risk operational environment yeah. is not a good strategy. No. Nope. Because... Hopefully, it goes well yeah. a lot of the time, which means there's not ne- not necessarily a lot of learning. Yeah. And a few times where it goes wrong, it goes really, really wrong. Yeah. Right? We are, uh, mowing as an example, right, is it, yeah. still, uh, unfortunately, one of the things where people are getting killed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are, there are still a potential to to harvest uh, out there by, by diving into how do we use, again, technology to enable better safety training yeah. to happen. And as, as a part of that journey, also uh, the appreciation of, of uh, letting people fail, but fail in a safe environment and then learn from it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and and that's again where I see that the uh, XR and immersive technologies is, is, is really, really a great tool for us to do that yeah. in, in a training setting, whether that happens in a training center, whether it happens... Uh, on the vessel or on the rig, uh, whether it happens with an instructor or whether it's, it is, you know, being next to them or whether the instructor is somewhere else in, in, in the world. There's so many uh, opportunities that are enabled by technology here. Yeah. And I mean, f- failing in a safe environment, I mean, I, I can relate uh, from, 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 a, from a gaming perspective. Uh, I mean, everybody with a, with a headset have probably tried Ricky's Plank, where you walk the plank and you're 30 stories above ground, uh, but, but just like walking on a piece of, of wood. Uh, so you're more like an inch or a couple of centimeters above ground, but, but your brain instantly just thinks yep. that, hey, I'm actually in a in a tough spot here, potentially very dangerous. So you can you can fail safely, but but your brain recognizes the danger, and thus I'm sure there's there's some scientific uh, explanation to why it it ingrains a little deeper than just reading a book. Hey, uh, don't fall off the edge here because that'll kill you. Actually, being on the edge yeah. and learning. Oh, I I really don't like being this close to the edge. And that and and. And you're absolutely right. And I think, uh, again, l- learning from, you can say failing, but learning from it. Uh, uh, if I should take a driving, for instance, in in, uh, in my, on my PlayStation, then yeah. once in a while you have to go off track to find out, okay, how, how do I do this safe and uh, yeah. efficient, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. And for that to feel like a natural experience for you, you need to have good artifacts. So that's yeah. that's one of the things that we also dived into together with uh, Penille and, and her students is, uh, how do we take the knowledge again that we have around how to design good environments with the right artifacts so the people they feel a high sense of control and they really get immersed um, yeah. well, one, of, one of the things I always look at is you know if you put people in the simulator you stress them a bit if they start using their own call signal instead of the vessel name they got in the in the exercise you normally know that they they are mentally there yeah. right yeah. and and that just means that that we have them exactly where we want yeah, yeah. So, so they can learn in the safe environment, yeah. uh, identify how could they improve, uh, 
get familiar with new strategies of, of coping with, with the risks that they encounter yeah. and then uh, take that with them when they go back on the job. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking just kind of to add on to this or extend it, yeah. I think that while we started our research together with Pierre to focus on the the, the actual tr- uh, trainees, like how do we make this environment, can this, it, it, you know, making the proof of concept that having these open-ended cooperative uh, extended reality situation, are they able to, to allow people to do what they're supposed to do? And we found out, yes, that is. But I think the next thing, which is also what we're looking into now, uh, Pierre and I, in what we're working on right now, uh, is this, that we have to move to also look at the trainers. Because one thing is that we make new tools that helps uh, people to actually learn something uh, and, and so on. But another thing is, how do we support the trainers in this? Because I think the trainers becomes the bottleneck when we want to reach out, um, because uh, it's very clear that one of the very strong um, in, uh, results we got from the first prototype uh, we did was that it was the reflective session afterwards with the trainer that really moves thing along. Um, so, so, that, so, so right now we are considering how do we also consider like what does trainers actually do when they monitor those kind of thing, and how do we? find ways to, can we build into our tools, into the extended reality, how we collect data about that and help the trainers to figure out how to assess and support the trainees in a way. Um, so, so I just want to, you know, add that. I think this is a, this is where we're doing, we have no results yet. We are like in the middle of that, but I'm very excited about where we are right now in the, in this, this respect. Yeah, exactly. How do we recognizing the trainer's key role? How do we then make sure that the trainer have better tools available? Yeah better data, et cetera, and maybe some, somewhere down the line. Also, uh, you know, finding out how do we need to present these, uh, these data to, to the learner as well. So again, we, we can enable more, more training to, to happen uh, self-paced and, and that way yeah. make it uh, more, more available. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Super interesting perspectives here. And, and I think we're moving on to, to the final uh, topic for, for today, the, the whole uh, thing about accelerated learning. And one thing that, that I see, and I'm sure you can you can acknowledge that, Pierre, is, is with, with the whole green energy transition uh, going on, we see a lot of, of, of construction going going on in very rural and, and not very accessible parts of the world where, where we need to put up uh, wind farms and so forth. And part of those solutions are typically around a, a local workforce being deployed to, to help building these uh, these farms and, and using extended reality as a tool to that is, is, is a great way of, of again, uh, decentralizing the, the learning experience. And, and again, perhaps, Penelope, you can add a little more scientific uh, angle to that, that the whole, I'm putting on a headset, I'm, I'm doing muscle movement, I'm, I'm learning to do, for example, I don't know, putting on a, a blade on a wind turbine so that it won't fall off, uh, that, that's unfortunate. Uh, but, but that training, wh- why is the, the, uh, the VR version of, of training like that a better option than, than classroom training or, or, hey, watch this movie and then go execute? <laughs> Uh, so uh, I I have difficulty in answer that specific <laughs> questions, but but I think what what is important here is that the actual knowledge required to you know fix a wind turbine or whatever kind of um, uh, green energy you know uh, equipment you're putting up requires a lot of very professional knowledge, and I think if we are to create high-end extended reality training environment, su- supporting this cooperative training, allowing these people to be able to do that. I think what is really key is that we need to find where the real knowledge about how to actually do it. And I think in this case, it is the trainer or the actual expert, and they are always the bottleneck. So I think it's very important. And then on the other hand, we have, if we are designing extended reality situation, we need programmers to be able to sit and program these things. So I think the way to go to really kind of uh, take um, advantage of these opportunities is to find ways that people who are the trainers, the expert, are able to having tools that doesn't require them to actually do the programming so they can develop their own cooperative situations and knowing that they, they have that knowledge. I think for me, that's where we need to kind of focus. How do we create tools um, and platforms that allow people with the profession not to create the time, type of training and help and also to constantly uh, reassess and change them and evaluate because 
you never know. I think we also discussed this before, Pierre, that yeah. you might have some idea about what the right training is, but then you see what's going on and you actually want to change that. And if you each time need to call up programmers uh, who are sitting at, um, and should make like new programming to make to make this training uh, on the go, uh, we will have like like a problem. So I think for me, if I think about the opportunity of this accelerated training is that we need to develop better tools and and support allowing people with the fresher knowledge to create the training environment themselves. But I, I 100% agree, Penilla, and yes, of course, we have discussed this this before, and I think it's also been one of the key drivers for us uh, partnering up with Synergy XR. Uh, again, we have uh, 40 years of experience, uh, you know, delivering high quality training, and I've been one of the front runners in implementing a simulator based uh, training. Yeah. So, the knowledge we have from there is that we can see that having the right environment and then having these few key artifacts. If you have that, you can create really, really good training situations. Yeah. And of course, uh, with the traditional approach where uh, you build uh, either a big physical uh, mock-up or you build a very expensive custom-made uh, simulator model, yeah. it's sometimes, you know, you, you get a slightly different needs uh, or you see something that could have been more optimal that is hard to change or expensive to change, yeah. where with a, with a customizable uh, platform, I uh, know this is not supposed to be a... Uh, uh, <laughs> Commercial, but but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I think with a customizable platform, it means that our trainers, which are the true experts, because they have this learning and knowledge uh, background, but they also have industry background. Uh, all of our trainers have industry background. We enable them to do small tweaks, small changes, right, and yeah. and to optimize the training. Yeah, and the way we train, just to add that on, is we are always uh, outcome driven, goal driven. Mm. So. It, it means that, you know, if you need to adjust a little bit on the environment to make sure that you, you reach the learning yeah. outcomes, the learning objectives, then, then that's what our trainers do. And that's where having a flexible tool will help us uh, bringing this to the next level. Yeah. I, th- I think uh, just to go one step back, because you, yeah, you also ahead. brought on the topic of, of localization, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. which is something that we support a lot of places mm-hmm. in the world, actually, uh, where... Part of building up uh, a sustainable uh, initiative uh, is not only about CO2 footprint, but it's exactly also about delivering value to the local community. Yeah. Some of the places we go, you can say there can be language barriers, uh, there can be uh, maybe they're not that educated uh, as, as we are yeah. in, in our part of the world, which is fair enough. Yeah. Right. But bringing a visual learning tool again, is, is a fantastic thing for us. Yeah. And actually also a thing that we, uh, in another study with, with a couple of uh, Panelis colleagues from another part of, of Copenhagen University, dived into, and where we could see that there was a fantastic, uh, really, really fantastic uh, outcome of using VR and XR technologies yeah. uh, with groups that are, you can say, non-Western and non-educated yeah. Uh, yeah which is, uh, I think, fantastic also. Yeah. So, so one thing is that it enables, you can say, better high-quality learning uh, in our parts of the world, but it's also a tool that, that actually can help doing good in the world. Which, yeah. uh, Breaking down some of the, the traditional barriers like language, culture, and... and exactly, because it, it's so visual. Yeah. Right. So, yes. so it... Uh, Compared yeah. to a PowerPoint, compared to a <laughs> written instruction, or yes, even worse, or right, sending training. out a, a big manual saying, yeah. here, here, Jacob, that's yeah. what you need to do. <laughs> Just do this, then then uh, everything will be safe, right? Yeah. Then then uh, showing you what does good look like, yeah. guiding you, but in a visual environment, and then maybe letting you do a bit uh, for free play to, you can say... Yeah. Uh, build high level of, of competence and then ultimately yeah. uh, reusing that environment, finishing off with a collaborative, immersive uh, learning that yeah. get a, a great debrief. Then, uh, you know, we are taking people all the way from basic skills to more advanced skills to uh, team working skills, collaborative skills, yeah. safety skills. So there's so many things we can do in, yeah. in these environments here. Yeah. yeah. Super interesting. And I think we covered uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the topics we wanted. Let me try to just do a, a conclusion and, and by all means chime in if you think I'm, I'm missing out on something. 
and and here's one of my uh, my favorite pet projects. I always want to bring Phil Dunphy from uh, Modern Family into every podcast I do. So <laughs> so the conclusion here must be that that the only constant is change, and and I I love how technology is enabling us to do something. And I mean, just a few years ago, uh, a VR headset was something super expensive that required a lot of uh, heavy tethering and and big gaming computers. Uh, Moore's law is still working on our side, so so it's becoming more and more accessible. And, and the ability to kind of send an education situation somewhere remote instead of bringing people into a, to a, to a physical location that that's is helping us across a lot of different industries uh, these days. Um, I, I, I really like how how we're moving from not only just putting a, a, a piece of a VR headset on on people's heads, but we also see a very uh, interesting um, uh, development in, in, in AR and, and I see that so that's probably also going to be part of the future of training that you put on a pair of glasses and then you get uh, on-site help uh, with whatever task you, you need um, and, and uh, again we're also moving from these large let's let's do a three four hour intensive uh, uh, learning situation of this topic breaking it down into these smaller chunks uh, this is the topic I need to, to improve right now. I have 10, 15, 20 minutes, put on a pair of glasses, do the training, let's let's put in these habits. I mean, I've, I've begun to, to do uh, reverse parkings on parking lots because, hey, it's yes. a habit that I've uh, learned from you guys. Yes. Uh, and, and there's a lot less accidents on parking lots if people back in. Uh, I'm, I'm holding the handrail when I walk up and down the stairs again. It's, it's, it's all about ingraining those habits and that's much more easy if you do these, these often shorter stints instead of uh, once a year, uh, a three day workshop. Uh, a, a little bit every day is better than, than a whole lot uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a longer frequency. So, so uh, yeah, I guess the, the conclusion uh, on this must be that, that extended reality and, and using technology for learning situations, it's definitely, uh, we're not done here. There's, uh, there's a whole lot more to come, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on this journey with you guys. Yes, uh, any, any final remarks from, from you, Pierre? No, I, think, um, I think you touched uh, on, on a lot of good things. I don't yeah. want to open a long <laughs> talk again, but I think exactly as you say, when you look at the future of learning, there is a multiple technologies that are affecting the future of learning. Yeah. And immersive technologies is, is definitely one of them, uh, whether it's making things uh, more accessible, whether it's... Uh, changing the way we are learning to, to be much more uh, learner-paced, whether it's yeah. building stronger behavior change intentions, which is some of the things we've been able to measure as, as well. Yeah. There's a lot of things where XR technologies can can help us, and, and that's why we're definitely seeing that being a, a big part of the future of learning. Yeah, and we're happy to be here with you. Merce training. Oh uh, Super yeah. excited. Yeah. We just got started, right? But Penille, uh, any final remarks on, on your end? I'm unsure if we have uh, visuals with Pamela. I think if I should... We can hear you. Yeah, yes, if, go ahead. If I should come... Can you hear me? Yes, loud can and clear. You hear me? Uh, so I, I think a final remark for me is that I think that the research challenges in figuring out how do we actually design a cooperative uh, extended reality environment for training um, continue to exist. I think it's important to continue to also consider how do we bring in the trainer or the professional knowledge in that. And then finally, how do we actually make tools that support people in creating these and re, uh, uh, re-editing uh, these uh, uh, training environment over time. I think that's kind of the main research challenge that we should continue to work on. Yeah, I, I, rapid prototyping, that, that's also where we aim at, at, that you constantly kind of fine tune your learnings. And, and I think the, also this, uh, I, I would say, a magic uh, triangle between, you can say, innovators and technology uh, like, like yourself and Synergy, uh, industry insider knowledge uh, and uh, that you can say more c- commercial and safety minded approach yeah. as, as as we have and then the research and scientific uh, angle that Panilla and her team bring, brings in at, at least I can only say from a training perspective that for that for us it's it's a r- really a, a golden uh, combination yeah 
I, I want to say on that high note. I agree. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, th I think it's so important that we work together closely and not just bring technology to the, but also industry experts and, and research experts and, and make sure that we get the most of the new technology. Exactly, and yeah. test it out quickly, right? Yeah. Like, like we have the opportunity to re really uh, get it in the hands of, of the real users uh, at, at, at speed. Yeah, right? absolutely. And then get someone that, that have the strong theoretical uh, background uh, to help us analyzing and improving on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Penille, thank you so much for joining us. And Pierre, thank Thanks. you for, so much for, for joining us again. Uh, it's this has been an uh, absolute pleasure. Thanks for, for sharing your insights on, on this topic with us. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to having you back. Thank you so much for today. And thank you, everybody who looked uh, in on this. Thanks so much. We'll be back. Bye-bye. Thanks. So back to your internet connection, Penile. Let's uh, have a talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no.